If you'll please stand as we open with a word of prayer. Lord God, what a glorious day it is to come and celebrate. It's a special day in the life of our church as we return finally back here to our sanctuary, this sacred room that is set apart for the worship of you. But Lord God, it is especially special because of your son's life, his resurrection from the grave. It is in that single historical event when his physical body rose, renewed, immortal, glorious, that we can come today in hope. No matter what fears we bring with us, no matter what worries we may have, no matter what obstacles we may be facing, as we look at the grave, we see how he overcame it. And we have a living hope to sustain us. As Bill Gaither said, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And we come in that spirit of celebration here today to give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll join me now as we state what we believe together through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Christ arose.
At this time, our children ages 2 through 3rd grade can head to the back with Miss Dawn for a special Easter Children's Church. She'll be excited to have you in there, I'm sure. So if you're 2 years old through 3rd grade, feel free to join her at the back and she will lead you down the Children's Church. I want to invite you to join me now for the privilege we have of praying to our Lord God Almighty. Our Heavenly Father, our Daddy, as we stand before this meal here today, it reminds us of your Son's awesome sacrifice, who you sent on our behalf, to walk among us, but eventually to die for us in our place, to take the penalty for our sins, and only an amazing sacrificial love could follow through on something like that when he was perfect and without sin. Oh, if we could only begin to grasp just how amazing your grace is. We sing about it often, but we really don't fully have a grasp of it. We give you praise for that. And you as the God in the heavens, only you in your wisdom could have devised a plan as you did to substitute your son in our place. And only you in your sacrificial love could follow through on that plan. And the fact that out of all of this universe, as you hold everything together on the largest of scales to the smallest of scales, you still care about each one of us who was made in your image, even though we turned our backs on you and fell short of your glory. But because of Christ. We can come as your adopted children, as co-heirs with Jesus to the glorious inheritance that you have in store for us throughout all of eternity. We pray, Lord, that your name will be hallowed, that it will be set apart and set above everyone and everything here on this earth. May others look at our lives and realize that as we bear your name, we represent and reflect the light of Jesus Christ. Help us as your church to set your name above all names as we reach out to the community. And we pray, Lord, for your kingdom to come. We know that it came entering this breaking through into history when Jesus came but we know it is not yet perfected. His death and resurrection sounded the trumpet of the impending victory. But until then, you have tasked us with expanding your kingdom here on this earth. Through sharing the gospel, not only in word, but in action. We pray, Lord, that your kingdom rule will rule over our hearts as we seek to let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we desire for your will to be done in our lives, but we confess so often we fall short of that. Help us to hear the soft, still voice of your Holy Spirit as you desire for us to share the power of the resurrection with others. Help us to understand what is at stake, not only for us, but for those who watch and look at us. We ask, Lord, that not only do you provide for our spiritual needs, but you provide for our daily needs and give us our daily bread. And for those of us who have been given more than we need, help us to be your hands and feet to meet the physical needs of others. For you desire that all have your daily bread. Lord God, we also ask that you forgive us our debts we look at Christ's payment and we know we could not have afforded the debt for our sin on our own but the fact that he paid it is so amazing and we pray Lord that we'll forgive others as you have forgiven us 
We have a blessing of your grace, but we also have the responsibility of your grace. So fill our hearts with your love in our daily relationships. We ask that you lead us not into temptation. Lead us far away from it and out of it. For those that are struggling with addictions and other things as they are here today, we pray, Lord, that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit so that that stronghold can be broken. Lord God, we pray that you will deliver us from the evil one. Help us to recognize that the one who looks as an angel of light, but in reality is a wolf in sheep's clothing. He loves to sugarcoat sin and to make it look good and taste good. But help us not to fall for his con job, we pray. Lord God, we come declaring today that yours is the kingdom. That everything and everyone will one day bow down and declare you to be Lord. We declare that yours is the power a power that can hold the universe together, a power that can raise your son from the dead, a power and authority for which is worthy of rule. And we give you the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. ready after that thank you choir for making this a special Easter as we worship our Lord most of you know we've been going through a sermon series throughout Lent on the Lord's prayer and it kind of is going to culminate today 
as we take a look at the closing doxology that while it is not in the scriptures per se, that Christ did not give us this specifically, many churches, including our own, when we recite the Lord's Prayer, we often include it at the end on a note of triumph and victory. When we declare, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. These words of praise proclaim, thine is the kingdom. That God is the king over everyone and everything. As it says in Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. The doxology proclaims thine is the power, power that God is all powerful and has the strength and ability to accomplish his victorious and benevolent purposes in the way that he sees fit without fail and without limitation. He established the natural laws with which we're mostly familiar. And even in doing so, as they govern the universe, he can miraculously suspend, supersede, or overcome them according to his good and gracious intentions. For this reason, we declare, thine is the glory forever. That God is the one of supreme importance, greatness, and honor. That God is the one who deserves all the credit for all that is good and right in this universe and throughout all of eternity. We then end with a very familiar word, the emphatic amen. I've heard it translated, so be it. The Hebrew word actually deals with truth that is solid and firm. In other words, you can bank your life on it in agreement. And one of the main reasons that we can ascribe the kingdom and the power and the glory forever to God with such confidence and certainty is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just a few decades after Christ walked this planet, just think about it, not hundreds of years, just mere decades after Jesus walked this planet, Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. For what I received, that means it existed before he got it, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Did you notice what he said in there? He had received this. That means it had been around for years already, this gospel truth. And he acknowledges that more than 500 men, most of whom were still living, had seen this resurrection power as well. And if they were still living, guess what? If it wasn't true, they could have debunked it. They could have said it was all false, that it was all made up like some do today. But they didn't do that. They didn't do that at all. And I like what pastor and author Andy Stanley says he tweeted a couple of years ago when somebody predicts their own death and resurrection and pulls it off we should go with whatever that person says i think they got some weight i like what he how he put it so when jesus proclaims in john eleven twenty five, 25 i am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live even though he dies we should stand up and take note of that if we are not believers we should consider what we may be missing out on. But if we do know Jesus personally, we should consider how much more depth there is to explore 
in getting to know this resurrection power on a deeper level. That's why we're turning to Ephesians chapter 1 briefly this morning. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. He says in encouraging those Christians there in Ephesus, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. What is he praying about? I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. How well do we know him this morning? You can sit in a church for decades and still not know him. At least not very well. How well do we know him? Paul is praying for these Christians to know him on a deeper level. He makes it clear that no matter how well we think we know Jesus, there is always room to grow. And the Holy Spirit within us has Per personal, intimate wisdom and knowledge that he wants to reveal to us concerning Jesus Christ. Paul continues in verse 18. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That reminds me of how we started this whole Lenten series several weeks ago. That wonderful truth about God being our Heavenly Father, our Daddy. And thus making us, through Christ, co-heirs to his eternal kingdom and glory. Because of Jesus' amazing sacrifice, we can look forward to, as Paul says, the riches of his glorious and eternal inheritance. And this is all made possible by what Paul calls his incomparably great power. Paul prays that the Holy Spirit within us as believers will reveal more and more personal wisdom and knowledge concerning this power that God has for us. To truly grasp the depths of the love and power of Christ within us requires more than an individual, private journey and effort apart from anyone else. The scripture makes this clear. It makes it clear that we need to be invested in one another in the church community. Our relationship with him is affected by our relationship with with one another yet how many of us have invested the time that it takes in corporate and personal worship in corporate and personal Bible study in corporate and personal prayer and in corporate and personal service to others it's a high calling it's a high blessing that yields great fruit and abundance I'm reminded of Herbert Jackson, who was teaching his seminary class one day. He was a former missionary, and he would always share about a car that he had been given that wouldn't crank without a push. So he, over the time, he devised this clever system, if you will, to go to the local nearby school and to ask a group of school children to push him off in the morning and throughout the day. He either left the motor running or he parked on an incline so he can get a roll in order to crank the car up. Well, two years later, roughly, the Jackson family, uh, due to personal reasons, had to leave the mission field. There was sickness in the family. And he was passing along the car to the next guy. And when he was doing so, he was kind of proudly explaining how he had made this thing work all these years, how he got the children to push start it, and how he did all he did, as I explained. But while he was talking, the gentleman popped the hood and started looking underneath it. And while he was sharing all this cleverly devised plan he had made it work all these years with, the guy said, if you'll pardon me, Mr. Jackson, uh, if you'll uh, let me look at the problem, it seems just to be a loose wire right here. And so he gave the cable a little twist, 
hopped into the car and pushed the ignition switch, and guess what happened? Cranked right up, ran like a charm. <laughs> For two years, Jackson had unnecessarily gone to all that trouble for nothing. And the point of him telling this story to his seminary students was this. He had had access to that power all along. But his unawareness of that loose connection had kept him from accessing it. I want to ask, in faith, do you truly believe, as Paul says, that with the Holy Spirit within us, that we have access to that incomparably great power? Do we believe it? If we do believe it, how's our connection? Is it loose or is it tight? We need to tighten that connection. In verse 19, Paul continues. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Think about it. In Christ, we have access to that same incomparably great power that was behind Jesus' resurrection and ascension for the believer resurrection and ascension power should not be something we celebrate on Easter Sunday and Ascension Sunday it should be a power that we're exploring every day we have access to that power that supernaturally transcended the natural law of decay and decomposition. In Psalm 16:10, David writes, and Peter later quotes this verse. He says, Concerning God, you will not abandon me, meaning Jesus, to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Rigor Morris doesn't take that long to begin setting in as your muscles tighten in that body that didn't happen with Jesus God not only prevented decay and restored Jesus life to his body but he also raised him with a transformed immortal glorious body it was somehow different one minute it could be there the next minute gone and we don't really know exactly what that's all about it's a mystery still but one thing's for sure, his body was different in a powerful way. Then in God's incomparably great power that he exerted in Christ, he, Christ ascended into heaven where he was seated on his throne at the right hand of God, that place of supreme honor and glory and authority over and above all. He has power and authority over the people in our lives, including those who worry us to death, including those who oppress us and wrong us. Think about that. With this incomparably great power within us, we can state what Psalm 118, 6 through 7 says with even more confidence. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. 
Not only is Christ highly exalted above all earthly kings and powers, but he is highly exalted over and above spiritual forces and demonic powers that seek to destroy us. As 1 John 4, 4 says, The one who is in you, meaning his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. If you're beaten, being beaten down and defeated, guess what's going on? It's not the fact that Satan has power over us. We can't truly say as Christ followers, the devil made me do it. Because in Christ, the devil can't make us do one thing. The only way Satan has power over us is if we fall for his lies and deceptions. And trust me, folks, he's extremely good at it and we often don't even know that he's doing it unless we are spiritually watching and praying as Jesus asked the disciples do, to do in the garden he's extremely good at it and the only power he has is through those lies if we fall for his lies and give him that power cause in Christ we can overcome in his death and resurrection Jesus broke that hold that the power of sin had over us. In Romans 6, 9 through 13, and I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, it says, Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. As we encounter the stresses and the struggles and the seasons of darkness in this world. We don't have to be defeated by depression. Because in Christ the resurrection power within us can not only prevent us from emotional decay and a downward spiral. But it can enable us to rise again in glorious victory. I know I've experienced that, and I know several of you have as well. As Jesus encouraged in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. Not you may have trouble, you will have trouble. But take heart. What did he say? I have overcome the world. Do we truly believe that? In Christ, we have resurrection power to face our fears. You remember what Paul told young Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 7? And I'm reading from the New King James Version. He said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. In Christ, we have resurrection power to proclaim the gospel and minister to our local communities, country, and the world. As the resurrection, resurrected Christ promised his disciples in Acts 1.8, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And if we're believers, we have the Spirit. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, meaning locally, in Judea and Samaria, in the country around you, and to the ends of the earth. Before COVID hit, I don't think many of us ever thought that little old Shiloh could be reaching people around the world, and we are occasionally. We've been in every continent now. Around the world. And I just think we're just getting the tip of the iceberg of what God's power can do if we will surrender to it. And allow him to have his way. Even as we face obstacles and opposition along the way, because we always do, we have resurrection power to assure us and sustain us 
even if it comes to us having to die for our faith because we have the hope that one day upon Christ's return that we like Christ before us will rise up from the grave in triumph and victory and then we could add another verse to that hymn we just sang up from the grave we all arose with a triumph over his foes here once again the promise we find in Jesus words in 1 Corinthians 15 51 through 57 Paul says listen I tell you a mystery we will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed for the imperishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality then the saying that is written will come true death has been swallowed up in victory where O death is your victory where O death is your sting the sting of death is sin but the power of the law sin is the law but thanks be to God he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ and hear his words of assurance in light of all this therefore my dear brothers stand firm let nothing move you Always give yourselves to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Sometimes we think we're just twiddling our thumbs as we work and work or we're like the mouse on the wheel getting nowhere. His power when we're truly serving Him is at work. Often on levels and in ways that we can't even begin to see or grasp. So let me ask, what's holding you back? What's been holding you back? What's been holding you down? Or better yet, who or what has a hold on you right now? Is it a particular sin? Is it that difficult person at school or at work or even at home? <laughs> Is it sickness? Is it worry and anxiety? Is it just this inner darkness and emptiness, this hole in your heart? If we know Christ personally as our Savior and Lord, then we have the Holy Spirit and resurrection power within us to not only endure, but also to overcome. But I don't feel like it. It's not about our feelings. It's about reality. It's not about our faith per se. It's about the one in whom we place our faith. My faith can be extremely weak, but if my faith is in the one who cannot be overcome, if I believe when I sit down in a chair that I don't know, I don't, it doesn't look like it can hold me, does it matter if the chair can hold me up how little my faith is? Faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. It's because of the greatness of and the firmness of the one in whom we believe. And that God raised his son from the dead. I'm reminded of Martin Luther's great words in that hymn we sing occasionally. And I just invite you to listen carefully to these words. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. You ever feel like mortal ills are prevailing? <laughs> For still our ancient foe, Satan, doth seek to work his woe. 
His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. I wonder how many have been striving here lately in your own strength and it's just not cutting it. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, that is Lord of the host, is his name. From age to age, the same. It doesn't change with time. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devil's field should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. The name of Jesus. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, and his kingdom is forever. Can you hear the incomparably great power, that resurrection power behind those words that we can live by? The only question is, is do we have that power? We know Christ personally as our Savior, as the one who died on the cross for our sins and have made him our Lord, the leader, the master of our lives. We have that power. We just need to tighten that connection. But if you're hearing this message and you're sensing God drawing you to him, if you're not certain that you know this power or have this power, it's available. It's available because Jesus came and died in our place. It's available because he rose from the grave. And his offer of living hope and eternal life and forgiveness and salvation are available for all of us if we will just receive the gift. How do we do this? We admit that we are sinners. Scripture says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. What does that sin do? Well, it says that it separates us from God. It puts a wedge in our relationship with God. It says in Isaiah 59.2, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And it gave us a death sentence. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We've got to admit that we're sinners. But we also got to trust in Christ as our Savior, as the one who received those wages of death for us. And trust in him that even though we didn't deserve it, he died in our place and then rose from the grave. We ask for forgiveness and we repent. That is, we turn from our sins and seek to follow Jesus as our Lord and leader and master as we depend on that resurrection power to do so. And that comes through inviting his Holy Spirit into our lives. I invite everyone, if you'll pray with me right now. If you would like to pray that prayer to receive Christ, I just invite you to quietly in your heart to pray after me. Father God, I admit that I have sinned that I fall way short of your glory but I now want to trust in Jesus as my Savior the one who died on the cross for my sins and the one who rose from the grave 
to give me that power in living hope. I ask for your forgiveness. I repent and ask for your Holy Spirit to fill my heart and help me to live for you. For I declare you to be my Lord, my leader, and my master. And for all of us, Lord, we pray that you will help us to keep our connection to your power tight. For nothing less will do. For when we do, Lord, there is no way that that power can be contained. If the grave could not contain it, most certainly the world cannot stifle it. Help that power to rise up in our hearts with the same passion for the world that Jesus demonstrated to the point of even dying on the cross. Help us to be victorious in expanding your kingdom here on this earth and spreading your influence. Help others to see the light of Jesus Christ in us. And we'll trust your Holy Spirit to do the rest. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the meal that we're about to share. We thank you for what it reminds us of, but we thank you for the resurrection power that it reminds us of as well. And we surrender the rest of this service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, the consistory members are going to come forward as we prepare to do communion. And I want to go ahead and explain how it's going to uh, work here for you. If you're here in the sanctuary we just ask that you will come down the center aisle and those on this side can get their bread here and then get their grape juice here and the same is true on the other side. Our um, consistent members will be handing it to you with gloves and a mask on for your own safety there. Uh, choir members, you'll have a couple that will be serving y'all as well up here um, as well. If you're in the balcony, just feel free to make your way down and get in the line as you can here in a moment. If you're in the fellowship hall or listening out in the parking lot, uh, we're going to have a couple of folks come out to you just shortly after the elements get distributed there. Okay, does it make sense? If not, follow the person in front of you and hope that they're right. <laughs> this time, the consistory members can come down. When we turn in the Gospel of Mark, we read these words. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God.
body broken for you. Christ's blood shed for you. Let us pray. Lord God, we come with thanksgiving. Blessed to be here in your presence because it was all made possible through your body that was broken and your blood that was shed. And we pray, Lord, that we will take the power that came through the cross and the resurrection with us to bless the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you now to please stand and sing, He Lives. of our normal benediction now we invite you to join us as we have concluded our Lent and Easter celebration that we recite the Lord's Prayer in song together. <laughs> 